Man, I am still on that time. All right, we are live.
song is we do not have to wait till we get to heaven to sing and shout to sick to victory. Amen? Amen? We can praise Jesus right now, right here, without waiting until we get to heaven. I pray you're not waiting till you get to heaven to praise Jesus and be happy. Because there's way too much to be unhappy about, but the happiness part is we have Jesus as our Savior, and we can sing and shout to victory right now. Amen. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you. Thank you for this wonderful day you've given us. Thank you for the breath in our lungs, uh, the life in our bodies. And thank you, Father God, for the for the place you put us in, in, in your kingdom, to do your kingdom work. And we pray, God, that tonight as we study your word, that we honor you uh, with putting our whole heart into it, Father. Trying our best to, to figure out uh, exactly what it means for us today. Lord, we, 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 we try our best to understand what your word is. And sometimes... Sometimes we just don't get it. We're praying, Father, for a great move of the Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us and direct us here. We pray, Father, that what we learn and, 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 and the things that you teach us, we can use to lead other people to Jesus Christ so that they, too, can know that victory. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, Brother Dave, you go. Thank you, Pastor. That is a beautiful song. And I can't wait one of these days when we get home to glory and see those, those pearly gates and those streets of gold, be able to see some loved ones that have gone on before, see our family, and then most of all, see our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. That will be what a glorious day. All right. Thank you so much, Pastor. All right, if you would, turn in your Bible. We're going to go ahead and get back to our study tonight. It's nice to be with you folks again tonight. And uh, we're going to look at 2 Samuel here. Our 1 Samuel chapter 2. I'll get it right here. 1 Samuel chapter 2. I've entitled this, Growing Up in the House of God. Growing Up in the House of God. Kind of follow along as I read. I'm going to read verses 1 through 4. And Hannah prayed and said, my heart rejoiceth in the Lord. Mine horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth is enlarged over mine enemies, because I rejoice in thy salvation. There is none holy as the Lord, for there is none beside thee. Neither is there any rock like our God. Talk no more so exceedingly proud. Let not arrogance come out of your mouth, for the Lord is a Lord of knowledge. And by him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty men are broken, and they that stumble are girded, are girded with strength. Mm. All right, verse one. Hannah prayed. Hannah's prayer here covers verses one through ten. Some think this is a beautiful song of her tribute of thanks to the Lord, and and I kind of agree with that. That it was a beautiful song, uh, and she was. She was thanking the Lord and praising the Lord for the gift of that, her son Samuel that she gave back to the Lord. Others think it is a song of praise of the prophetic and messianic character. All right? And it is, and we'll see this as we look through these uh, first ten verses, that it is there is prophetic thought here and prophetic things here. There's also messianic things here, uh, talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, and we will see this as we study along. Also in verse 1, notice the phrase, Mine horn is exalted in the Lord. Horn signifies power, might, and dominion. The symbol is taken from the ox whose strength is in his horns. So Hannah, Hannah's strength came from the Lord. And it's the same way today, folks. Not only does Hannah's, did Hannah's strength come from the Lord, our strength today comes from the Lord. Also in verse 1, notice the phrase, my mouth is enlarged. This speaks of her speech being incited and stirred up. The mouth, mouth enlarged refers to the gesture of gaping. Remember the Lord Jesus Christ, they gaped on him when he was hanging on that cross. So the mouth enlarged refers to the gesture of gaping. In the Middle East, it was a sign of derision and contempt. But here with Hannah, 
That wasn't the case at all. Hannah's mouth was enlarged because she wanted to praise the Lord for her son and what he had done in her life. And so her mouth was enlarged. She was able to speak out. Verse 2. Notice the phrase there. There is none holy as the Lord. It is, it is the holiness of the Lord that sets him apart from man. Isaiah 6.3 states this. It says, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Let me say that again. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. 1 Peter 1.16 states this. It says, be ye holy, for I am holy. And folks, that verse is for us today. Be ye holy. God wants his people to be holy. Be ye holy because for I am holy. So God wants us to be holy. Also in verse 2, notice the phrase, any rock like our God. The term rock as applied to God is first found in the song of Moses in Deuteronomy chapter 32 verse 4. Rock is a metaphor to express the strength and permanence of the Lord. Psalms 89 verse 20, uh, 26 states this, says, Thou art my Father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. Verse 3, look at the phrase here, The Lord is a God of knowledge. The word knowledge comes from the Hebrew word omniscient. Uh, it is a divine attribute of God. With God, it speaks of him being all-knowing. He's omniscient. He's all-knowing. Verse 4. Notice the phrase, bows of the mighty. Sometimes the bow signifies judgments. Other times the bow is a symbol of victory. Here, the bow signifies the breaking of men or Better still, the breaking of the enemies of Israel. Let's continue on here, verses 5 through 10. Follow along as I read. They that were full have hired out themselves for bread, and they that were hungry cease, so that the barren hath both born seven, and she that hath many children is waxed feeble. The Lord killeth and maketh alive. He bringeth down to the grave. And bringeth up. The Lord maketh poor and maketh rich. He bringeth low and lifteth up. He raiseth up the poor out of the dust and lifteth up the beggar from the dunghill to set them among princes and to make them inherit the throne of glory. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord, and he hath set the world upon them. He will keep the feet of his saints, and the wicked shall be silent in darkness. For by strength shall no man prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Out of heaven shall be thunder upon them. The Lord shall judge the earth, the ends of the earth, and he shall give strength unto his king and exalt the horn of the anointed. All right, verse 5. Notice the phrase there. They that were full have hired themselves out for bread. This is a reference to the changes of life. A person can be full, have all their needs met, everything is great. Then they can lose all and be working for bread to put on the table. The rich and well-to-do can become so poor as to hire themselves out for bread. Verse 7 states it this way. It says, the Lord maketh poor and maketh rich. Verse 6, notice the phrase, the Lord killeth and maketh alive. The issues of life and death are in the hand of God. He can give life and he can take it away. Verse 6, also in verse 6, notice the phrase, he bringeth down to the grave and bringeth up. God can reduce a person to the lowest state of degradation. Then he can restore that same person to prosperity and and happiness. God is all powerful. Verse 7 states it this way. It says, He bringeth low and he lifteth up. God is able to do anything. God is all powerful. Verse 8. Notice the phrase here. He raiseth up the poor out of the dust 
and lifteth up the beggar from the dunghill. In God's providence, a person can be raised from the lowest to the highest. He can take the poorest beggars and make them princes. J. Vernon McGee used to say it like this, from the guttermost to the uttermost. Mm. In other words, from the very gutter, God can lift you up to be a, a, the most powerful person in the world. God has all power. God is in control. Ver, also in verse 8, notice the phrase, the dung hill. The dung hill was a pile or heap of animal waste. It was heaped up to dry in the sun. It was used to fertilize plants and as fuel for fires. In scripture, the dung hill denoted the deepest degradation. It was also a sign of deepest dejection. So here it says the, he lifted up the beggar from the dung hill. He lifted up the beggar from the deepest degradation, from the deepest dejection, lifted him up. He can do that. God is all powerful. Verse 8, also again, the phrase, the pillars of the earth are the Lord's. This is a reference to the rulers of the earth. They are set up by God and preserved by him. They can also be removed by him. God is all powerful and there is nothing too hard for him. Verse 9, the phrase, he will keep the feet of his saints. This is a poetic figure meaning he will preserve them from error or sin. God desires to order and direct all the goings of his saints. He desires to keep them from every evil way. I know this is written way back here in 1 Samuel, but you know what? It's just as true a fact today. God desires to direct and order the goings of his saints. You and I, he wants to keep us from every evil way. Also in verse 9, notice the phrase, his saints. The Hebrew word used for saints is rendered loyalty in love. It conveys the idea of loyalty to an agreement. The best example in human affairs is faithfulness to the marriage vow. As one maid is faithful to the other maid and vice versa. This is a good example of what God wants. God wants us to love him and to be faithful to him. Verse 10. The phrase, the adversaries of the Lord shall be broken. The adversaries are those who continue sinning against God's law. They oppose his word and persecute his people, but they shall be judged. There is a great white throne judgment coming someday. And if they don't turn their ways around, if they don't repent of their sins, one day they're going to stand before the Lord Jesus Christ at the great white throne of judgment. And he's going to say to them, Depart from me, ye workers of iniquity, for I never knew you. Also in verse 10, notice the phrase, Exalt the horn of his anointed. This is the first place in scripture where the word anointed or Messiah occurs. It is pointing prophetically to the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ is God's anointed, his anointed one. He is also the Messiah of Israel, and he is the Savior of you and I, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's continue on. Let's look at verses 11 through 14. Kind of follow along as I read. And Elkanah went to Ramah to his house, and the child did minister unto the Lord before Eli the priest. Now the sons of Eli were sons of Belial. They knew not the Lord. And the priest's custom was, with the people was that when any man offered a sacrifice, the priest's servants came while the flesh was in seething with a flesh hook of three teeth in his hand. And he struck it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot. And all that the flesh hook brought up, the priest took for himself. So they did in Shiloh unto all the Israelites that came thither. All right, let's break it down. Look at verse 11. The phrase, the child did minister unto the Lord. Samuel was engaged in some occupation. He may have been playing the cymbals or other instruments of music. It could have been 
He could have been lighting the lamps. And we'll see later on in, the, in this study uh, another job that he also did. But let's continue on. Verse 12. Notice the phrase, the sons of Eli were sons of Belial. We saw that word before, Belial. But let's look at it. Sons of Belial speaks of sons of worthlessness. Sons of Belial also speaks of being perverse or wicked. This verse says, Eli's son did not know the Lord. You know, and I thought about this as I was going over it. I thought about it today as I was going over it again. You know, there's going to be people in churches all around the world that think they know the Lord, but they don't really know the Lord. And one day, if they don't get things right, they don't ask Jesus to come into their life, save their soul, one day they're going to stand before him, and he's going to say, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity, for I never knew you. That's a shame, but it's, it could happen, and probably it's going to happen. Also notice in verse 13, the phrase, when any man's son, when any man offered sacrifice. Deuteronomy 18.3 describes the priest's portion. And this shall be the priest's due from the people, from them that offer a sacrifice, whether it be ox or sheep, and they shall give unto the priest the shoulder and the two cheeks and the maul. All right, so, all right, so here it is. It describes priest, the priest. It says, and this shall be the priest's due, the priest's portion. What was the priest's due or priest's portion? He was to get the shoulder the two cheeks, and the maul. And I'm not going to go into definition or whatever all that was, you know. But anyway, let's go on. Verse 15 to 17. Also, before they burnt the fat, the priest's servant came and said to the man that sacrificed, Give flesh to roast for the priest, for he will not have sodden flesh of thee, but raw. And if any man said unto him, Let them not fail to burn the fat presently, and then take as much as thy soul desire. Then he would answer him, Nay, but thou shalt give it me now. And if not, I will take it by force. Wherefore the sin of the young men was very great before the Lord. For men ab abhorred the offering of the Lord. All right, let's look at verse 15 and 16. The phrase there, before they burnt the fat. These young men would serve themselves before God was served. They did not want sodden or boiled flesh. They wanted to roast the meat. They said, or the servants, their servants, they said servants to get this. Their servants said, give it to me or I will take it by force. Verse 17, the phrase, the sin of the young men was very great. Because of their actions, men abhorred or hated the offering. So let's look at these twofold sins of the sons of Eli. Number one, the first one was, instead of taking only their allotted portion, and we just looked at that in Exodus, what their allotted portion was, instead of taking just their allotted portion, they took all that the fork would hold. So they just reached, it, reached in there and just grabbed out all they could get. So that was their first sin. They Instead of taking their allotted portion, they took all the pork would bring would hold. Number two sin, they took their share before the fat and blood were offered in sacrifice to the Lord. This was God's plan. God wanted the fat and the, and the blood offered first as an offering to him. And these men were interceding before God. They were taking wanted to take their portion first. This was a gross act of disobedience and lawlessness on their part. Let's continue on. Verse 18 to 21. Kind of follow along as I read. But Samuel ministered before the Lord, being a child, girded with a linen ephod. Moreover, his mother made him a little coat and brought it to him from year to year when she came up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. And Eli blessed Elkanah and his wife and said, The Lord give thee seed of this woman for the loan which is lent to the Lord. And they went unto their own home. And the Lord visited Hannah so that she conceived and bare three sons and two daughters. And the child grew before the Lord. All right, look at verse 18. The phrase there, 
girded with a linen ephod. A linen ephod was a small shoulder garment used in sacred service. It was the usual dress of the priest. This was a mark of Samuel's special dedication to the Lord's service. A linen ephod could also be worn by inferior uh, priests, Levites, judges, and eminent persons. Verse 19. Look at the phrase, His mother made him a little coat. This was a little cloak or upper garment to keep him from the cold. It was worn as an outer garment over the tunic. Did you notice also, it says there, year by year, year to year? Hannah only came with her husband on the yearly sacrifice when they came up for the yearly feast. They only came once a year. So think about this. She only came once a year, brought him a little coat. So she only saw Samuel, her firstborn son. She only saw him once a year for a few days there, maybe a week or so. Wow, what a sacrifice of this woman to give up her son, to lend him to the Lord. Of course, God's going to really use him. All right, let's go on. Verse 20 and 21. Notice the phrase, Eli blessed Elkanah and his wife. Hannah conceived and bare three sons and two daughters. So altogether, she had four sons. She had Eli and three sons and two daughters. All right, let's continue on. Verse 22 to 25, kind of follow along as I read. Now Eli was very old and heard all that his sons did unto all Israel and how they lay with the women that assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And he said unto them, Why do ye such things? For I hear of your evil dealings by all this people. Nay, my sons, for it is no good report that I hear. Ye make the Lord's people to transgress. If one man sin against another, the judge shall judge him. But if a man sin against the Lord, who shall entreat for him? Notwithstanding, they hearken not unto the voice of their father, because the Lord would slay them. Verse 22, notice the phrase there. They lay with the women that assembled at the door of the tabernacle. Some think these women were employed about the tabernacle. Others think there were nursery attendants for some for small children like Samuel, like Samuel. Still others think Eli's sons introduced prostitution into the Shiloh temple or tabernacle. Verse 23 and 24. Eli's, let's look at Eli's parenting skills. Eli's parenting skills must be questioned. He was too indulgent. He only reprimanded them. He said, why do you do such things? He had the authority to bring them under stern discipline. He could have, as the high priest, he could have had them removed from the priesthood. He could have had them uh, 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 sternly whipped or whatever, you know, and, and caused a, a, a stern discipline upon them. But no, what did he do? He rebuked them. He reprimanded them. He said, why do ye do ye such things? Verse 25, the phrase, if a man sin against the Lord, if a man sin against the Lord, who can be his arbitrator? Who can act as his judge? Who can settle the dispute? You see, when we settle, when we sin against men, we've got the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's our arbitrator. He's our judge. He's the one that's going to dispute our case. Well, what happens when we, uh, when we sin against the Lord? Who's our arbitrator? Who's our judge? Who's going to dispute the case? No one, because the sin is against God. Verse 25, the phrase, They hearken not unto the voice of their father. They would not listen. He re his reproof made no impression upon them. They did whatever they wanted to do. You know, it kind of reminds me of the time of the judges. Remember the time of the judges? There was no king in Israel. And everyone did that which was right in their own eyes. Here, these uh, Eli's sons, they did what was right in their own eyes. Unfortunately, it was not right in God's eyes, at least unfortunately for them. Also in verse 25, notice the phrase there, the Lord would slay them. If Eli's sons continued to ignore and defy the laws of God, 
God would have no recourse but to slay them. Ezekiel 18.32, God said this, I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth, saith the Lord God. Wherefore, turn yourselves and live ye. Let me say, live ye. Let me say that again. For I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth, saith the Lord God. Wherefore, turn, ye, turn yourselves and live ye. Here's what it's saying. God has no pleasure in the death of anyone that dies. Now, death here is not talking about just death and going to the grave. Death here is talking about eternal separation from God in the lake of fire. And God says, I have no pleasure in that. I don't want to see anyone have to go to the lake of fire. So, what does he say? Therefore, or wherefore, turn yourself. Repent. Ask forgiveness. Get the, your life straightened out. Why? So you can live and have that eternal life with the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice uh, what it says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. 2 Peter 3, 9, there tells us that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God's not willing any should perish. Perish there again. It's talking about not just dying and going to the grave, because we as believers, born-again believers, we, we may die and go to the grave, but one day we're going to be resurrected and go to go live with the Lord Jesus Christ for and have eternal life. But here it's talking about that being separated from God, being being lost, being in that lake of fire forever. He says God's not willing that any should perish, that any should have to go through this. What's the answer? But that all should come to repentance. Anyone can be saved. There is not any sin that anyone can do that is so grievous, so horrible, so bad, that they cannot repent of that sin and accept Jesus as their Savior. So let's go on. First, uh, uh, verse 26 to 29. Kind of follow along as I read. And the child Samuel grew on and was in favor both with the Lord and also with men. And there came a man of God unto Eli and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Did I plainly appear unto the house of of thy father when they were in Egypt in Pharaoh's house? And did I choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to offer upon mine altar, to burn incense, to wear an ephod before me? And did I give unto the house of thy father all the offerings made by fire of the children of Israel? Wherefore kick ye at my sacrifice and at mine offerings? which I have commanded in my habitation, and honors thy sons above me to make yourselves fat with the cheapest of all the offerings of Israel, my people. All right? Let's look at verse 27, the phrase. There came a man of God unto Eli. His name or identity is not revealed. All it says about him is he comes and he speaks in, on God's behalf. He comes and he gives Eli the warning that God wants him to give, and then he's off the scene. Also in verse 27, notice the phrase, unto the house of thy father. This is a reference to Aaron, the first high priest. Eli was a descendant of Aaron. Thus, the phrase, the house of thy father. So, if you take Eli, uh, Eli and you go back, 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 you'll come to Aaron, the original, or the first high priest. Verse 28, God said, I chose him out of all the tribes of Israel. The high priesthood was a place of great honor. God chose Aaron to be the high priest. He chose Aaron to offer sacrifices, to burn incense, and wear an ephah. To burn incense was to sprinkle a powder over live coals and thus create an aroma or a sweet smell that came up to God. Verse 29. Look at the phrase. Wherefore kick ye at my sacrifice? Eli tolerated the profane be behavior of his son. He allowed them to desecrate the offerings and sacrifices of God. In so doing, he honored his sons above God. All right, let's continue on. Verse 30 through 33, kind of follow along as I read. Wherefore, the Lord God of Israel said, 
I said indeed that thy house and the house of thy father should walk before me forever. But now the Lord saith, Be it far from me. For them that honor me, I will honor. And they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Behold, the days come that I will cut off thine arm and the arm of thy father's house, that there shall not be an old man in thine house. And thou shalt see an enemy in my habitation. In all the wealth which God shall give Israel, and there shall not be an old man in thine house forever. And the and the, the man of and the man of thine, whom I shall not cut off from mine altar, shall be to consume thine eyes and to grieve thine heart. And all the increase of thine house shall die in the flower of their age. Alright, verse 30, the phrase, should walk before me forever. God promised that Aaron and his family would be in the priesthood forever. Exodus 29 verse 9 says this, And thou shalt gird them with girdles, Aaron and his son, and put the bonnets on them, and the priest's office shall be theirs for a perpetual statue. And thou shalt consecrate Aaron and his, and his son. A perpetual, the word perpetual means lasting forever. So it was a lasting forever statute, or a perpetual statute, that they would be the, the priest, that the high priest, and it would go through, go through Aaron's line, went down to Eleazar, and then down to Eleazar's son, and on down. This was a conditional promise. If they remained faithful and walked, it walked worthily. Verse 30, the phrase, be it far from me. This seems to be a favorite phrase in the books of, Sam, books of Samuel. It occurs a number of times, three times in the, in the books of Samuel, and it is also rendered God forbid. And that's also listed three times in the books of, books of Samuel. The phrase, then notice also in verse 30, notice the phrase, them that honor me. This is still God's plan, and he will never depart from it. Those that honor him will be honored. Those who despise him shall be held in light esteem. Folks, think about that. God does not change. And those, and that goes for those the people back there. It goes for Eli's sons. It goes for us today. Those that honor him will be honored. But those who despise him shall be held in light in light esteem. Verse 31. The phrase, I will cut off thy arm. The arm speaks of strength, power, and influence of a family. To cut off the arm means to remove their strength, power, and influence. Verse 31 to 33. The phrase, that there shall not be an old man in thine house. Eli's descendants would be cut off in the flower of their age or the flower of their youth. Some think the flower of their youth was about 30 years old. 30 was the legal age to discharge the priestly function. All right, let's continue on. Verse 24, uh, 34 to 36. This shall be a sign unto thee that, that shall come upon thy two sons, on Hophni and Phinehas, in one day they shall die, both of them. And I will raise me up a faithful priest that shall do according to that which is in mine heart and in my mind. And I will build him a sure house, and he shall walk before mine anointed forever. And he shall, and it shall come to pass that everyone that is left in thine house shall come and crouch to him for a piece of silver and a morsel of bread, and shall say, Put me, I pray thee, into one of the priest's office, that I may eat a piece of bread. Verse 34. Let's look at the phrase, This shall be a sign unto you. The sign was that both his sons would be killed in the battle with the Philistines. We'll be seeing that in the near, very near future. This sign revealed that the punishment would be carried out in its fullest extent. Verse 35. The phrase, I will raise me up a faithful priest. Some think this is a reference to Zadok, 
who replaced Abiathar. That's in 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 26 to 27. Abiathar was the last descendant of the house of Eli. The high priesthood will, will continue in Zadok's line through the last monarch. Others think a faithful priest is a reference to the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. And it is very much, like I say, a prophetic messianic promise. He is going to be, he is the faithful high priest. He is the chief priest. And one day he will be our chief priest if he isn't already. Verse 36. Eli's line will come into such abject disfavor as to beg for work. They will beg for a piece of silver. A piece of silver was the smallest Hebrew coin. They will beg for a morsel of bread. A morsel of bread was barely enough to keep one along. What a striking contrast. From the superabundance enjoyed by Eli's sons to his descendants, having to beg for a piece of silver, beg for a morsel of bread. But remember what Galatians 6, verse 7 says? Galatians 6, 7 says this, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. You see, Eli's son sowed, and then they had to reap. But not only their sowing did they have to reap, all of their descendants thereafter had to reap what they sowed. Wow, what an eye-opener. And folks, we need to remember that, that as a man soweth, so shall he reap. And that is our study for tonight. But before I hand it over to the pastor, I do want to say, as I do every week, I do want to say stay tuned to next Wednesday. Next Wednesday, we'll look at uh, chapter 3. Chapter 3, I've entitled The Call of Samuel. The Call of Samuel. Now I'm going to turn it over to Pastor Lord. He's going to come and uh, lead us in a, a praise song and, and then close us out in prayer. Pastor Lord.
young child because he was going to church. He was hearing all the stories, but nobody in church was telling him how to be saved, and that's really kind of unfortunate. Um, I won't mention what that church was. I don't even think it exists anymore. I don't think that denomination exists anymore, but that's beside the point is that it's the Holy Spirit that starts to work on you and lead you, and you might feel that right now, and you might wonder, well, how can I, how can I get over this sin so that I can be with God, so that I can have the salvation that so many people talk about, that the Spirit's leading you to, well, it's just simple. You just accept the free gift of salvation. For by grace you are saved through faith, not that of yourselves. It's a gift of God. See, God loves you, and He has a gift for you. He doesn't want you. It's like that, that passage that He shared with you. The Lord doesn't take delight in death at all. He, he wants you to be saved, but He's giving you a choice, by the way. He's giving you a choice to make that decision. And, um, and it's really simple. It says, whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So I'm going to ask you tonight, if you're watching, if you've never watched anything like this before, if you're just stumbling across it right now, people out there that are saved, if you'll start praying for those lost people. Start praying right now. Just pray, Father, please, in the name of Jesus Christ, all those that are lost that, that feel that, that pull of the Holy Spirit. And even those that don't, Father, we ask for a great move of the Holy Spirit in this place, in this town, in this county, in this state, in this nation, in this country, Father, in the world, for all those, for all those who are looking, Father God, for all those who are needing salvation, we pray now for a great, a great move in that, a great, a great revival in the church, and a, and a great move, Father, for people to come to Jesus Christ, because the time is drawing near, and we can feel it, and we know it. And even if it doesn't come today or doesn't come tomorrow, doesn't come for a hundred years, we may not as individuals have until tomorrow to get to know you, Father God. And I just pray, Lord, that you start affecting those people right here and right now. I pray, Lord, for those that are right now thinking about it, that they would just come to you and just say, I want you, Father. I know, and it's so simple. Just pray a prayer with me. If you're not saved, just pray, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. And I want to repent of my sin. I repent of my sin. I want to turn from my sin. And accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior right here, right now. If you prayed that prayer, if you prayed that prayer and asked Jesus to be the Lord of your life, you're saved and your name is written in the book of life. And you've got, you've got an eternity to spend in heaven with our Creator, with our loving Father. And I pray you did that. And if you did that, uh, send us a note and let us know that that happened. And, and we will start praying for you. And if you need to know of a church to go to, we will... Uh, try to get you in the right direction, and if you need a Bible, we'll we'll figure out a way and make sure that you get one, because uh, it's it's time for you to start learning about the Lord. Uh, so if you would join with me in one final song this evening, I changed my mind on what I was gonna what I was gonna uh, uh, do this evening, so I got out my my magic stick here that changes keys on <laughs> because uh, B flat's a little key to play in. Um, a lot of you are going to know the words to this. No, I don't skip any. I don't skip any verses. Uh, I'm not a typical Baptist. I don't do one, two, and four. We don't skip three here. We do them all. And so you might know it, but it is called "How Great Thou Art."